Hello again. Welcome back. Thank you for tuning in this week. So I just want to talk about the spring market this week and how not to get fooled into, you know, jumping into something you're not ready to or whatever the case may be. Of course, there are lots of people that are ready to buy and have been waiting for the spring and they wait for the nice weather. That's fine. There will always be lots of buyers out there. But don't get FOMO'd in by listening to the stories with multiple offers and things like that and increasing prices because it happens every year and it's not uh, abnormal, should I say. So again, this is not your last chance to buy a house. This is just a normal spring market. And let me explain. So where are we in the market right now? And uh, besides the spring, we're, we're obviously in entering the spring market. We've actually had an early spring. The weather's been good, lots of activity, little snow. So it's really started a lot earlier this year, and it has had a big impact so far, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, some of the agents out there will tell you, oh, there's like places that are selling like crazy. You should buy now. And they're not wrong in certain respects. Saying you should buy now, I don't agree with. I think you buy when you're ready, like I always say. But uh, the market is active, it is springtime, and it's, uh, again, it's normal for the time of year. So let's get into where we are in the market, looking at the specifically now and the bigger picture. So first off, I'm going to start with my home buying recipe. I know there's uh, been a lot of requests for me to update it. There hasn't been much going on, so I didn't really update it too much. But I did just do a quick update. Uh, nothing has really changed but when things do change, they're going to change quickly, but we're not at that point yet. Actually, my forecast previously was, you know, towards the end of the year into next year for buying opportunities, but things are heading in the right direction. So, of course, we still have falling prices. Rates rates are not falling, but I did give it that one bar of battery juice because there's a lot of talk of falling interest rates and the timelines add up. If you look for or watch my previous videos, you'll know that the timeline, uh, you know, between 12 and 24 months, I think it was for rate holds or for rates to be at their high point and then they'll start cutting. So that puts us on track from sometime from the summer to the winter for rate cuts to start happening. And of course, uh, that means falling prices. If you, again, if you have watched my previous videos and high unemployment, we did tick down just one bar last month in January, but uh, again, it has risen. So we do have one bar there and the high mortgage arrears and delinquencies that uh, still record low, they have ticked up, but they still are at record lows. But again, we won't see those rise until unemployment starts to rise further and whatnot. So before I get into the data, I just want to explain that I am obviously using Ontario data from the Toronto Real Estate Board and the ITSO area surrounding. So it's a big representation of the Canadian population, but I don't have access to, you know, BC data like I have access to Ontario or Montreal or Quebec or any of those places. So again, uh, this is why I have to use this data, but it is relevant to do the overall big picture for most people and most places in Canada. So let's start off with kind of the short term trend here for uh, February. So February, it's not over yet. All of these charts today are as of February 26, which was yesterday. So of course, February 2024 has shown up and it's almost over and we are up substantially a month over month from January. And of course, if you look at last year, we're up uh over last year just a little bit also but last year's february 2023 was up over january so that's again looking at the immediate uh, price changes but let's look at the bigger picture now and see uh, if everything else is trending towards a bull market or if we're still heading down uh, the swamps like i think we are so I've gone back to 2021, January 2021 with all of these charts, and I have February circled here in red circles, and you can see just looking at them, you know, again, we're up over 2023 by just a little bit, but uh, down from 2022 and 2021. Now, just looking at them, you can see every one of those years have had big increases over January. So it's a normal thing to happen. February spikes up over January. It's coming into the new year. and weather dependent but uh, regardless it's the new year people want to go get out there and start looking now back to 2021 we had another increase in Jan or in sorry in march but then it started declining 2022 we all know what happened that was the peak of our market 
And then last year, we had a pretty significant spring where it did increase for, what, three, four months after February, three months after February. This year, who knows? We'll see what's going to happen. But now I'm going to move on to the next chart, which this is the true representation of how the market's doing, how it compares to previous years, and that price is not the only thing that matters. Actually, the only thing that is doing well is the price, and that is because it's a seasonal thing. So first off, uh, these are split between TREB and ITSO. So this is first uh, TREB, the sales to new listings ratio. This is the health of the market. Is it a buyer's market, seller's market, and how are things doing? So for every new listing, how many sales are there? So back in February 2021, almost 75 sales for every 100 listings. Uh, pretty healthy. It's uh, anything above 60% is a seller's market. Then we move on to February 2022. That dropped just a bit. It was around 70% or so, maybe 68%. Then last year, last February 2023, it was, what, 55% or so. Now we're well below that 50%, uh, closer to 45 maybe 43%. So you can see how it's changed the trend uh, from the last few years. It's gone from very healthy, almost 75%, down to the low 40s now. So big difference, uh, not looking better than last year, looking a lot worse Next, we move on to ITSO. ITSO, again, back in 2021, it was over 75%, uh, what, it was almost 80%. For every 100 new listings, there would be 80 sales, which is a very lopsided to the seller side market. Then uh, next year, 2022, that dropped to 75%. 2023, just under 60% or so. And now we're barely over 50%. So again, it has been declining. Not as good as last year, not as good as previous years. So you can see how these other statistics are showing how weak the market is getting year over year. Let's continue on. Next is the days to sell. How many days does a listing sit on the market? Starting with the Toronto Real Estate Board data. And you can see it's going up in February 2021. It was around 15 days. February 2022 was 10 days. That was the low point. And now look, uh, last year was what, 26, 27 days. Now we're just under or just around 30 days. So it's taken more time this year than it did last year for the average house to sell. Moving on to the ITSO data, the same trend. February 2022 being the low point. But then last year, it was, what, 33, 34 days, and now we're 40 days on market to sell the average house in the ITSO area. As you can see, the market is clearly changing with all of these statistics year by year. Moving on to the next data set, the close price to the original price ratio. How much are homes selling for in comparison to their list price? Starting with TREB here, we have uh, 2021, it was well over 100%, probably about 107, 108% in February 2021. February 2022, 118 or 117, 118%, which was insane. Then last year, February 2023, we were down to 97.9, uh, if my memory serves me correct. And this year, we're at 98.4, so it did creep up a bit but still back to more normal levels. It's so uh, very similar trend, almost 109% back in 2021, February, 2022, 119%. Then February, 2023, we came way down. I forget the exact number. It did creep up a little bit this year over last year's February, but still it's in that normal range for considering the balance of the market right now. This next chart or the next two charts, in my opinion, are the most important ones because this shows you the true balance of supply and demand. And this is the months of inventory. This really does account for supply and demand because it doesn't just take into consideration new listings. It takes into consideration all listings. So it's a very good snapshot of all the data to get a true market balance. So starting with TREB months of inventory, this is all residential, all areas, just like the rest of the charts. They are laid out by months to make it easier to see this data. And you can see, looking at this chart here, September, October, and November of 2023 was the first time since 2009 that any month has been above four months of inventory. 
So that is a very significant piece of data, and it proves that the market and which direction the market is going. We have more months of inventory, more than any month since 2009. And of course, yes, prices are climbing in the spring, but it doesn't matter because the month of inventory is increasing and it's trending upwards. And here's the same data from ITSO. And again, three of those months are above any other month since 2016. So of course, it now takes longer to sell. There's less buyers for every new listing that comes on the market. And if we're seeing that reflected in the months of inventory, which is continuing to rise and will continue to rise into this year. And one last chart while we're on this inventory topic, here are the number of new listings and the average sale price of new homes only. So new listings on MLS, but new homes only. And these are from both Treb and ITSO. And of course, the conversation is they can't build enough homes. They're not, we're going to be short so many new homes, which I agree with the, with the levels of immigration we're at, but the data doesn't lie here. 2014, as you look onwards, we have more new listings listed on the MLS now than we ever have in the last 10 years or as far back as I can get this data. That's because builders can't sell their homes anymore. They're too expensive. People can't afford them. So they're probably forced to list on MLS. Prior to this, they didn't need to list on MLS. So it's not that there's more new homes for sale, but it's just that they need MLS to sell them now. And they're turning to more traditional methods instead of the sales events with pre-construction buyers lining up outside to give their deposits. And just looking at the red line there, the average sale price, you'll see in 2017, it starts to dip down. So the average sale price goes down. And of course, our supply and demand rules or laws or whatever you want to call them, the inventory goes up. Same thing happened from 2022 to 2023. New construction home prices go down on MLS. And of course, the listings go up. So as prices continue to decline throughout the next year, two, three, however long it is, you will see more inventory come online. And this is that supply and demand dynamic that we'll see. So what about immigration now? Well, I forgot about immigration. I, I I'm actually going to have to go change all my charts now because the immigrants are going to come buy all these homes that are sitting on the market and uh, there's going to be no inventory anymore. That's not the case. The case is most immigrants don't buy homes right away, especially not in this market. I actually talked to one of you viewers this week. I talk to you regularly. Sometimes you call me, sometimes you email me. And he's an immigrant. He came in 2019. He's probably watching. You know who you are. I won't say your name. But he's lived here since 2019, and of all the immigrants he knows, and he is from one of the countries that have probably the most uh, immigrants per capita come here, he said they usually wait like four to five years, and not all immigrants buy a house either. He said it's probably 60 to 70 percent, uh, but not all of them, and they wait four to five years on average. And it was a very good point because I agreed with them. And I've talked to many immigrants. They call me up and they ask me for my advice. And they don't know the history of the house prices in Canada, which I have to explain because they haven't always been this high and we are in a bubble. And a lot of them don't realize that we are in a housing bubble. They think it's expensive and whatnot, but they don't realize and they don't know the history. So a lot of these immigrants that came in 2022 and 2023, they're not going to be buying until 2026, 2027. I think that it'll be a good time for them to buy because the market will be a lot slower by then. There'll be a lot more inventory and I'm sure there'll be a lot more distressed sales by then too. So, okay, they're, where are they going to live now then so that so they can't afford to buy a house or they don't want to buy a house? Some of them do buy houses, but again, the majority don't. Where do they live? Well, here are the number of active lease listings by month with basement or lower in the address. And this, this data is from the ITSO, the 20 boards surrounding the GTA. I couldn't pull this data from Trev because they don't allow the keyword searching on that system or they don't have that option. But this one by, by the address. So when they, a lot of the agents list, they'll say, you know, this address lower when it's not a legal, like one, two, three, a legal triplex or duplex, whatever the case may be. When it's a regular house with a basement apartment, uh, they will list it uh, and it'll say lower or basement. So going back to 2014, again, as far as back as I can go with this data, you can see there's very few listings per month with those uh, terms in the address. Then you get to this year, to 2023 and 2024 now, and it just shoots up. It's 5,000% higher than it was in 2014. It's 
1,000% higher than it was in 2018, and it's almost 200% higher than it was two years ago. So the amount of basement apartments and lower level apartments that have been created, and of course, there's upper level apartments now too because of these, has gone through the roof. Not everybody lists them on MLS, and not everybody does list them that to say lower or basement either. So there's even more than this chart would show. And this is just in the 20 board surrounding the GTA. So again, where do the immigrants live? So a lot of them will rent apartments, they'll rent whole houses, but a lot of them are living in these basements or main floor of these uh, listings that say basements because there's two units there. And it brings me back to when I first came to Canada. I came in 1988 with my parents and we lived in Brampton. First of all, we lived with my aunt in Keswick for three weeks. And then we rented the main floor of a bungalow. It was a detached bungalow and someone else rented the basement. We were a family of six at the time. So uh, we were kind of, you know, crushed in this three bedroom place. Well, it wasn't too bad, two per, per room, but somebody else lived in the basement and we had to share the laundry. So again, it wasn't uncommon back then. But now it's a lot more common. There has been tons of units. And I've said this before. I estimated 800,000 plus in the last few years have been created in Canada. But I'm thinking it's closer to a million now. So we have a lot of new inventory that's unaccounted for. And this is where the immigrants are living. A lot of them. Not all of them. But there's a lot of them living in these situations. If you're living in one of these situations, yeah, put it in the comments. Let me know. Or if you know somebody that is. And they're not bad situations. It's just creating more density in neighborhoods, but uh, they got to do what they have to do. And this is what happens when you have a housing crisis. People have to become creative and make accessory or basement apartments in, uh, in their homes. Anyway, as always, let me know what you think in the comments. And until next week, I'll see you then.